שנה טובה. Do you know what Rav Ahabar Yaakov said? Do you? He made the outrageous claim, outrageous, that anyone who denies idolatry acknowledges the entire Torah and the converse. Anyone who engages in idolatry denies the entire Torah. Do you believe that? So my question is, what is so bad about idolatry? Honestly, who's really harmed by bowing down to an idol? For those of you who have been to the Parthenon in Nashville, or who have seen the first Percy Jackson movie, you'll remember that there's a huge, huge statue of Athena in the Parthenon on the second level. Rebecca and I were taking some friends from out of town there, and we witnessed a self-identifying pagan lying on the ground, bowing down and worshiping the statue with her young daughter. She complained that the ground was dusty. It was curious but not immoral. Worshiping the goddess of wisdom, kissing a mezuzah or a Torah scroll, blowing a smelly horn that was once attached to a ram, curious, but not immoral. We are here on the second day of a Jewish New Year's celebration in the seventh month on the Jewish calendar and the ninth month on the Gregorian calendar that we all use. Again, curious, but not immoral. Here's what's really curious. How can a religion that's 3,000 years old still be relevant today? And when it's worse than not relevant, when it's not just ancient, but antiquated, what do we do? The halacha says that we're supposed to allow ourselves to be killed rather than murder someone, rape someone, or commit idolatry. I'm fully on board with being killed rather than murder or rape. But when it comes to idolatry, I don't know. I'm not sure. How about crossing my fingers behind my back? About 700 years ago, a famous enough rabbi named Menachem Meiri in Provence was faced with something of a predicament. He lived among Christians. Christianity was considered idolatry because Christians considered Jesus to be God. Maimonides, who lived before Menachem Eiri and who lived among Muslims, was unequivocal in identifying Christianity with idolatry. The Talmud prohibits Jews from doing business with idol worshipers because it supports their idolatrous practices. So the predicament was that Jews were doing business with their neighbors, the idolaters. The Me'iri could have ignored the situation, as rabbis before him and around him did, but that's intellectually dishonest and turns Judaism into something that we take seriously only when not terribly inconvenient. When American Jews felt as though they had to work on Saturday to keep their jobs, some rabbis ignored the problem while others started an early morning service so folks could daven and then go to work. So here's what the Meiri did. He explained that although Christians have turned Jesus into a god and an object, an object of worship, Christianity doesn't fit the Talmud's description 
of idolatry. The Talmud's model idolaters were Roman pagans who engaged in immoral acts, usually of a sexual nature, as part of their worship. But the Meiri acknowledged that Christians are theoretically bound to a moral code. There's nothing inherently immoral about Christianity, even though we Jews have been on the receiving end of lots of immoral behavior at the hands of individual Christians. The Meiri thought Christianity was making an intellectual mistake with the Trinity. But none of the Talmud's prohibitions against dealing with idolaters apply to Christians because they are restricted by a moral code. As a matter of fact, because of that moral code that Christianity spread throughout much of the world, Maimonides, the guy who said Christianity was idolatry, he recognized Christianity's contribution to bringing closer the Messianic era. Because without the spread of the Hebrew prophets by the Christian proselytizers, the world would not know of Amos and Isaiah. If I understand the Meiri correctly, idolatry is really not about what you believe, it's about what you do. Believing that Jesus is God is not enough to determine that Christianity is idolatry. That is so Jewish, right? It's not about what you believe, it's about what you do. Think about the movie, The Ten Commandments. There weren't any close-ups of the scene of the golden calf because the biblical verse says they ate and drank and litzachek. Now that verb has a wide variety of meanings from to play to to play around. The tradition understands that after they satisfied their bellies and drank, they satisfied their underbellies. The problem wasn't worshiping a golden calf, but how they engaged in their worship of that young bull. Yesterday, I mentioned the two creation stories. Among their differences are the settings. In Genesis 1, the setting is planet Earth. The second account of creation is set in the Garden of Eden, and we're actually given the names of, two, of the four rivers there, including the Tigris and the Euphrates. The Torah moves us literally and literarily from the universal to the particular. You feel that tension that oscillation, that sway in the first chapters of the Torah, and it never goes away. The prophet Isaiah, whom we'll read on Yom Kippur, identifies us as God's people. That's in the morning Haftarah. By Yom Kippur Mincha, Jonah is sent to our arch enemies, the Ninevites, to get them to do tshuva so God doesn't destroy their homeland which we had been praying for, we the Israelites. Again, we move from the particular to the universal. There's a midrash in the Talmud that when God gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, God's voice was received by everyone in the world in their own language, in their own style of communication. For this Midrash, Revelation was both particular and universal simultaneously. Each of us, Jew and Gentile, heard or experienced the divine tailored to our own mamalushan. It's wonderful that we have such universalistic teachings in our classical texts because it gives us a foundation upon which to construct a contemporary theology that's firmly rooted in our ancient wisdom, but is not antiquated. Part of the reason we need to revitalize our theology is because our universe has gotten a lot bigger in the past 3,000 years. When Genesis 1 was composed, stargazers knew of the wandering planets in our solar system, 
and stars beyond that seemed to move in a fixed rotation. More or less, what the ancient astrologers saw in the sky was confined to a single galaxy, the Milky Way. We've known for over a century that the Milky Way is not the only galaxy. A very low estimate of the number of galaxies in the universe is 100 billion. The man who proved the existence of other galaxies was Edwin Hubble. And until last year, the telescope named after him was the biggest and best space telescope available. But since last December, the new Webb Space Telescope is giving us mind-blowing images of deep space, including something called the Cartwheel Galaxy. The field of view shown in an image of the Cartwheel Galaxy from the Webb Telescope internet site, which I highly recommend, the field of vision is more than 300,000 light years across. A light year is the distance that light travels in one year at 160,000 miles per second. One light year is just under six trillion miles. That's one light year. And the photo of the Cartwheel Galaxy was over 300,000 light years across. Moses Maimonides wrote the first legal code to include laws dealing with temple sacrifices, which hadn't been done in a thousand years, and laws dealing with the wars of the Messiah, which hadn't yet happened. This is how he begins his halachic code, written in 1170, which he called the Mishneh Torah, the second Torah. He called his legal code the second Torah because if you have the Torah, and his book, the second Torah, those are all the Jewish books you need, he said. I disagree. This is how he begins his halachic code. The foundation of all foundations and the pillar of wisdom is to know that there is a primary being who brought into being all existence. All the beings in the heavens, the earth, and what is between them came into existence from the truth of his being. The entity is the God of the world and the Lord of the entire earth. He controls the sphere with infinite and unbounded power. This power continues without interruption because the sphere is constantly revolving and it's impossible for it to revolve without someone causing it to revolve. That one is he, blessed be he, who causes it to, to revolve without a hand or any other corporeal dimension. We would call that astronomy. We would call that science. Maybe we would call that philosophy. For Maimonides, God is the force responsible for the movement of the heavenly spheres. That's how he begins his Allahic code, talking about the stars. That's his foundation of all foundations for observant Jews. That's what he thinks observant Jews need to know to be good observant Jews. Kabbalah, the mystical tradition, brings Maimonides' philosophical and scientific God back to earth and puts sparks of the divine into humans. But for the mystics, only Jews had divine sparks. Only Jews. Gentiles were not so holy. Maimonides, on the other hand, didn't think that any humans had divine sparks, but he did believe that, may, that what made someone more godly had nothing to do with whether or not they were Jewish. So let me put this in contemporary terms. The mystics were Jewish supremacists, and the philosophers were intellectual elitists. For Maimonides' crowd, what made someone godly was their intellectual development, and the Torah's laws were intended to provide peace and security in society to enable everybody 
to study philosophy and science. The religion of Maimonides is incompatible with the religion of the mystics. But God is greater than any single religion. Judaism's lack of dogmatic theology, some creed that you have to believe is Jews in order to be a Jew, our lack of dogmatic theology is a godsend because we can pick and choose those elements of our tradition that make sense given our ever-expanding knowledge of God's ever-expanding universe. A few weeks ago, Dr. Barry Manson, a doctor who deals with vision, shared a story during our weekly Shabbos prayer service. He talked about being out on the river and having what Maimonides described as a flash of prophecy, a vision of how God's world with all its different hues and textures and temperatures and strategies for coexistence fit together as a unity and how we are part of that unity. The author of the Tao of Physics, which some of you read in your youth, no doubt, begins that popular book by describing a flash he had by the ocean. I have been blessed with such flashes myself. Although they are rare and precious for the individual, these experiences form the foundations for religions and religious commitment. And Barry Manson reminded all of us last month that they're still happening. Revelation or a flash of prophecy or an epiphany is an encounter, a vision that discloses a unified reality. What we do, how we respond to that vision is called religion. Judaism as a religion is a collective response not to a natural setting, but to an experience of liberation from enslavement. We were slaves, now we're free. The sea opened up, the world opened up. What's next? There's one more component in classical Judaism that is required for today's Judaism. Judaism is not now, nor has it ever been, a literalist tradition. The Torah, the Talmud, and Midrash, they're all religious literature intended to be read literarily, not literally. The prohibition of placing a stumbling block before the blind is about offering bad advice to somebody who doesn't know any better, not about putting a milk crate in front of a blind man's apartment door. I would hope that we don't need a law to stop us from doing that. When I first arrived at AJ, I revealed that Amelia Bedelia was really Amelia the Amalekite because she took things literally. She drew curtains with crayons rather than with cords. One of Maimonides' greatest contributions was to give example after example of the figurative use of language in the Torah. Here's what he had to say about the Messianic days. Don't think that in the Messianic days any facet of the world's nature will change or that there will be innovations in the work of creation. The world will continue according to its pattern. And when Isaiah says the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, those words are a metaphor and a parable. The interpretation of the prophecy is that Israel will dwell securely together with the wicked Gentiles who are likened to a wolf and a leopard. Iran will stop its nuclear program. Then, Maimonides says, they will all return to the true religion and no longer steal or destroy. Rather, they will eat permitted food at peace with Israel, as Isaiah continues to say, 
the lion will eat straw like an ox. Treating the Talmud and Torah as religious literature was explicit with Maimonides, but it's characteristic of all rabbinic writings. And Maimonides uses figurative language himself. When he talks about the Messianic age, when all people will return to the true religion, he's not talking about Judaism. Judaism was never the religion of all humans, so all humans can't return to it. And there's nothing true, there is nothing true about Judaism that is exclusive to Judaism. The only universal religion to which people could return was pure reason. And that's precisely how Maimonides understands or reads as a parable the Garden of Eden story. Religion, what people do and how they worship God, is a local particular response to what we believe is true. For Maimonides, what we know to be true is from science and science alone, and science is universal. For us today, science corroborates those flashes of revelation that some people are blessed to experience. And reason limits what we can reasonably claim about God. Here's what Rob Cook wrote 100 years ago. The spirit of teshuva, of aligning yourself with God's goodness, hovers over all the world. And it is that which endows all worlds with impetus to development. Teshuva emerges from the depths of being from such great depths in which the individual stands, not as a separate entity, but rather as a continuation of the vastness of universal existence. The whole world is pervaded by this harmony. The unifying congruence penetrates all branches of existence. The inner moral sense and its mighty demands represent an echo of the unifying voice of all its parts of existence, all of which interpenetrate, and the self is permeated with them and united with them all. Anima Amin. I believe that mystical description of the universe and our connection to it and in it. And there's nothing that Darwin or Einstein or academic biblical criticism or the Webb Space Telescope has discovered that has challenged, or that could challenge, Rob Cook's vision. God is bigger than biology, or physics, or even astronomy. And those who make a God out of biology, physics, or astronomy, are turning God into an idol. And here's the problem. There's no inner moral sense with its mighty demands in those scientific fields. And to make a God who lacks morality is immoral. To make a God who lacks morality is immoral. God is bigger than religion because religion, as the Talmud said 2,000 years ago, reflects our local and particular idiosyncrasies, our lifestyles, our language. Religion is our response to God, and we all respond differently. Once the conversation between religions shifts to an understanding that our ancestors created these metaphors, and metaphors about gods are called myths, then we can appreciate one another's myths for what they do, for what they ask of us, and how they align with and promote the values that we espouse. We can learn from each other because God is greater than religion. That line, God is greater than religion, is from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. He was an unapologetic Jew and an unabashed universalist. Just as Judaism has always contained both attitudes of particularism and universalism, even if it wasn't present in each and every Jew, we, can embody both. 
We can fervently disagree on matters of doctrine or theology or politics. But that doesn't diminish anyone's value or preciousness as human beings. Here's Heschel in his own words. A religious person is one who holds God and man in one thought at one time at all times who suffers in himself harm done to others, whose greatest passion is compassion, whose greatest strength is love and defiance of despair. Do we feel the harm done to others? Do we show compassion for folks boiling water in Jackson, Mississippi, or fleeing floods in Pakistan, or living under military occupation? Heschel contends that a religious person's greatest strengths are love and defiance of despair. Odlo avda tikvatenu. We have not lost hope. Hope is our heritage. As for love, that may be too tall in order for many, if not for most of us. So we'll follow our sage's counsel and do loving acts with the hope that love will follow. In an essay called No Religion is an Island, Heschel wrote that religion is a means, not an end. It becomes idolatrous when regarded as an end in itself. That's the problem with idolatry. It limits your moral horizons and clouds your moral vision. That's why Rav Ahabar Yaakov said, one who rejects idolatry acknowledges the entire Torah. Because rejecting idolatry is rejecting the notion that only some people are created in God's image and only some people are worthy of your compassion. The Torah demands we show love to our neighbors, we pursue justice, and we walk modestly with our God. I'd like to leave you with a midrash that casts us back to the Garden of Eden, to the time of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. The Midrash says that before the fratricide, each tree and vine brought forth 926 different kinds of fruit. Each tree, each vine. But after Cain murdered Abel, the trees and vines went into mourning and brought forth only one single kind of fruit. But the Midrash continues, in the coming world, the vines and trees will once again blossom with a full bounty. In our mythic beginnings, it was obvious that different looking fruits were brought forth from the same tree with the same roots. But something went wrong. Tribalism emerged, and people began denying that all people in all religions share the same roots despite their differences. It won't always be like this. As we sing in the Elenu, there will be a day when the Lord shall be one with one name. We will relearn that we are all from the same stock, from the same divine root. It's an ancient midrash, a universal dream, and a messianic goal that defies despair and promises a rainbow cornucopia. Shana Toba, Tehatevu, Pitehatemu. Shkoa.